Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. Today's video is a really exciting one and the start of a year's worth of videos that I'll be doing here at Glassbren. Glassbren are an agroecological permaculture market garden. I've been doing some videos here and with Abel who runs it, who's just behind the camera, hey Abel. He'll be here in a second. And for my own purposes, as much as hopefully for yourselves, I, I wanted to just follow throughout a year and see the ups, the downs, and get into some of the kind of nitty gritty of running a market garden like this. This is filmed in the middle of February. I'm aiming that this, we're gonna do a video every month, probably in the second week of each month, to then post it at the end of that month. It's gonna mostly be able rather than myself, and it's just gonna go into challenges, successes, the ways in which the, the land changes throughout the year, the types of plants, the amount of the plants, the amount of the harvest, things like that, as well as hopefully each month a kind of specific theme that Abel's gonna delve into a little bit deeper. First of all though, Abel needs to be introduced. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, oh no, you need to be in the middle. I'll just leave, okay, I'll just leave. Hang on, hang on, okay. Okay, so spring has arrived on the garden here. It's February. First of all, here in the big tunnel, we've got the overwintered spring cabbages, chard that's been here through the whole winter, oriental salads, some Asian leaves, some purple frills, some mustards. And then over in the other tunnel, we've got some lovely spinach, some more salads, more mustard, some buckshorn plantain. The garden's looking pretty, pretty quiet this time of year where um, we're actually a bit behind this year on some of the work. So the garden's been in its winter slumber. We've just got some overwintered onions that we planted a set back in October and the rest of the garden is sleeping. Some of it's under tarp, some of it's under a heavy mulch and slowly over the next few weeks we're going to get started with preparing the beds and starting to sow some of the first crops outside. So as we come to the end of the winter um, we're kind of picking up the pieces of some of the challenges that we've had. So um, if you remember that, that really heavy freeze that we had, the minus 10 temperatures, um, that presented some challenges for us. We lost some of the crops that we wouldn't usually expect to do so over the winter. And also we lost our water pump, which powers the overhead irrigation for these tunnels here. So that's been a bit of a big challenge. We're gonna to have to replace that. But otherwise, everything's looking pretty good. We can kind of start to see the life coming back to the garden, start to see the land um, warming up, the soil's warming up. So um, yeah, it's really time to start thinking about um, getting our first seeds in. One of the bigger challenges has just been time. We've been quite busy with other things. Um, some of the other projects we're working on, some of the business admin type things. So we're a bit behind on getting started with the growing season, but that's something we've kind of learned to be okay with uh, as years progress, because with weirding that's happening with the climate and with the weather um, and with the season kind of pushing back more and more each year, we don't feel so much urgency to get the seeds in really early because it just means that we have to run the heated seed bench for longer. We're more susceptible to random weather events like heavy frosts, and it means that the, the plants really hit the ground running and when the weather really warms up in March time. So every month we're gonna share with you a little bit from the garden, what's going on and, and uh, you know what we're up to around the garden, but also we're gonna focus on one particular theme that's really relevant and alive for us at that time of year. So um, this month, uh, it's all about seeds. This is the month where the seed sowing really starts in earnest. So when we start to get our first seeds in the cells, in the ground, we're gonna talk all about seeds, the kind of seeds that we use, how we grow them, how we propagate them, um, some sowing techniques, things like that, that we're thinking about this time of year. So we grow mainly with open pollinated seeds, which is a really important distinction from hybrid seeds. Um, open pollinated seeds are seeds that have been pollinated naturally through natural processes, so by insects or by the wind, and they typically carry a lot more genetic diversity. They're often a lot more adapted to the local environment and climate. So we focus on particularly Welsh grown seeds and UK grown seeds from companies like Real Seeds, Vital Seeds, the Seed Cooperative and the newly formed Wales Seed Hub, which means we can guarantee that we're growing vegetables that have been grown specifically uh, for this climate, for this environment, um, and that will really thrive here. And also that will allow us to keep alive some of those heritage heirloom varieties that are becoming rarer and rarer as time goes on. Because it's really important to um, preserve the heritage varieties that have been passed down from generation to generation and have traveled around the world and also keep genetic diversity alive, uh, which is really under threat in the world of seed. So we really need to work hard to, to preserve those seeds that have the stories of the people that have grown them generation after generation alive. Through the pandemic in uh, early 2020, it became really hard to get hold of the seed we needed. So we started to look into seed saving with a lot more 
um, commitment. So seed saving became really important to not just preserve the diversity of seeds, to keep them alive. It was also to make sure that we had a resilient supply of seeds that we could guarantee we would have the seeds we needed season after season going forward, no matter what crises or, or interruptions to the sort of supply chain happened. So we do more and more seed saving every year and, and a lot of the seed that we grow now is seed that we've saved from the land here. So local seed resilience is really important and swapping seeds and sharing seeds between growers is a really key way that we can keep a reliable supply of seed um, available to us as local growers that's adapted to this land and this climate. And one really great opportunity for that for people that live in or around Carmarthen is Seedy Saturday Carmarthen coming up on the 4th of March at the Nurture Centre where there'll be a seed swap an eco fair and lots of information and talks and workshops around seed saving and gardening and Jason's actually going to be there and he's going to film the whole day so there'll be a video available for you to watch and if we're talking to you after the 4th of March 2023 it's an annual thing so it's going to happen every year so look out for more information about that on Facebook and in the meantime we're going to head over to our seed house and start sowing some of those saved tomato seeds that we saved last year ready for the 250 tomato plants that we're going to plant into this tunnel here and we're going to talk more about how we propagate seeds, how we get them started and ways that you can uh, give them a little boost in the colder months of the year going forward. Okay let's go. Okay so here we are in the seed house where we do all our propagation where we start all of our seeds and I'm here on the potting bench getting started with sowing some of our tomato seeds um, from a seed that we saved from last year's crop. Um, a gardener's delight variety that we um, that we grow. It's a really nice cherry tomato variety. So yeah, I'm going to start by filling this uh, plug tray that we have. This, these come from PG Horticulture, in case you're interested. Um, and yeah, we just start piling on. This is a beautiful um, worm compost that's made by Martins TLC, um, which for anyone in West Wales um, is a really great um, project um, up at Clinview Care Farm. Um, and they produce this beautiful seed compost from um, their worm farms up there. And we love it here, it's really good, has a really good germination rate. Yeah, the young seedlings seem to love it. So what I do, just filling it up, um, making sure every cell is full and then giving it a bit of a tamp down. That shows any kind of air pockets that might be there. And then throw some more on, make sure you're filling every cell fully. Okay, and once your tray is full, uh, like this, um, I just go in with two fingers, depending on the seed that you're sowing, um, that kind of dictates what kind of depth you want to go, but not too deep for tomatoes, because obviously, if you think about how a tomato seed would self-seed, so if a seed was dropped on the ground, it's not a very heavy seed, it's not very big, um, so it's not gonna need much of an indent to sort of self-seed itself, so um, we want it to be nice and close to the light nice and close to the surface. Um, there are ways you can do this that are more efficient. So you can get these boards that have little, little dibbers attached to them that can do the whole tray in one go, but it's pretty quick just to do it that way. Um, so next, seeds. So I have my um, saved Gardener's Delight seeds here and I'm just gonna start popping them in. One into each cell. One way to deal with really fiddly seeds um, that are quite hard to pick up with your two fingers is to just get a little stick like this, um, wet the end of the stick and just you can really easily pick up individual seeds and place them down in the cells. So we're going to be growing about 240 tomato plants uh, but we also want to grow heaps on to share with our community. So um, yeah, we're probably going to do between 500 and 700 tomato plants this year. The beauty of saving seed is that from not that many plants, you can save hundreds and hundreds of seeds. So, um, yeah, it's really a great money saving exercise. And, and we'll talk more about seed saving later in the year when it comes to or to harvest time when, when crops are coming into seed. We might show you some seed saving techniques quickly, but it's really a great skill to have if you're getting into gardening. Now that all the cells are filled with tomato seeds, what I need to do is cover them over with a thin layer of compost, just flush to the top of the cells. 
Now I pre-watered my uh, seed tray, so I don't actually need to water them at this point, um, but we'll just keep them moist as they grow on. And then I'm gonna write a little tag with the variety, the date that I planted them, um, with my initials on it so we know who sowed them. Um, and it's ready to go on the heated seed bench. Okay, so this is our heated seed bench. This is kind of a critical part of our February seed sowing process. Um, so this is a really simple uh, homemade heated seed bench, which is essentially just a big box of sand with heated cable, thermal, thermal cable running through it. So basically what we've got here is just a wooden box on a really strong frame because there's quite a big weight of sand in here. And then we've got insulation, any kind of reclaimed insulation, um, anything you can find. And then we've got a tarp um, for waterproofing, keep that insulation clean and keep the water contained in the sand. And then we've got about a ton of sand on this bench of this size. And then through the sand, we're running a thermal cable. Now that cable is part of a system that you can pick up from BioGreen UK. That's where we got it from, who also have some really great uh, video resources of how to put together your own homemade heated tea bench. And so essentially the heated cable runs off this thermostat and we can choose what kind of temperature we want the sand to be at because plants really care about the temperature of the soil, not the temperature of the air. So what we're doing is artificially heating the, the soil conditions for our young seedlings um, to kind of let them know that it's spring, it's warm, it's time to start growing. So particularly this time of year when we were starting our tomatoes, our peppers, things like that, we want uh, our heated seed bench to be at a constant kind of anywhere between 18 and 24 degrees, um, depending on the plants and the requirements of the seeds to germinate. So yeah, we've got heat, heated cable running through the sand, that heats the sand, the sand heats the the compost in the module trays um, and that allows our, our plants to germinate at the temperature that they need. And then later on in the season we'll run this till around April and we'll use it just to sort of kickstart germination quickly in some of the seeds and then take them off and uh, put them on ambient temperature after that. So that's how we do our seeds, that's how we start our seeds in February. So just to finish I'm going to take you on a quick tour around the garden um, and see what's happening in February. <laughs> so hey, uh can you give me a tour? Yep. Let's go. Yep. Leaving the packing shed. I'll try and hold, I'll be, I'll turn around in less than a second because my arm's going to get tired. Here we are at the first, first no dig beds. So we're all no dig here at Glass Bren, uh, which means that we don't turn or till the soil. We just add layers of organic matter compost um, between every crop. So um, these are some good examples of no dig beds. So we've got 75 centimeter wide beds, kind of foot wide wood chip paths. And that's kind of the standardized system that we use throughout the garden. Um, and that makes crop planning really easily because, because um, we know that every bed is the same width, so we know that every meter of bed produces the same amount of food. And so you can kind of work that out with your crop planning according to how much you need to produce of each vegetable. Yeah, and here we've got the last bit of the kale that's been sitting in here probably for close to nine, 10 months now. Um, and soon enough that's gonna come out and we're gonna redress these beds ready for um, spring planting. So you can see that um, there's a kind of gentle curve to all of the beds in the garden here. And that's for a really good reason is that we've laid our beds on contour. So on the line of the hillside um, of equal altitude. So you, you might know contour lines from, a, from an OS map, um, but basically what we've done is laid our beds on the contour line of the hillside to make sure that they're level, to make sure that the paths, the ditches in between them are level so that the water stops and sinks doesn't run off taking valuable soil nutrients with it and also looks looks more beautiful than straight lines don't you think in here we're going to have um, probably have our beetroot things like that spinach um, leafy greens all kinds of things going on in there and then if you follow me down here in the summertime this is where the jerusalem artichokes are growing up beautiful tall sunflower like plants that produce these lovely nutritious tubers um, so that's all just resting right now obviously it's february in the garden so um, spring's just starting to to happen now and um, things have just been in their winter slumber so we're just starting to think about getting the garden ready for the first sowings um, and the first plantings first thing going outside parsnips 
Um, and then we'll put in our broad beans and our dwarf sugar snap peas in about a month. Um, yeah, so we're just starting to think about getting out some of those weeds, um, tidying everything up, making it ready because it looks a bit of a mess right now. Um, yeah, let's keep going. So yeah, you can see a bit more clearly here the kind of natural sweep of the of the contour line. Um, these are a bit, this bit steeper here, so the contour line's a bit more drastic. Um, so this kind of area is a bit different in the sense that it's slowly transitioning towards more of a forest garden. So you can see we've got lines of trees here. We've got sea buckthorn up here, which is a beautiful nitrogen fixing um, shrub plant, produces highly nutrient dense berries, little orange berries that are delicious and go in and really good in the medicine for getting lots of um, phytochemicals and antioxidants and all those things. Um, we've got globe artichokes in here, which is a lovely perennial vegetable. Um, there's pear trees. We've got a line of elder through here for berries. We've got sage, we've got rocket. We've got things that are kind of self-seeding all over the place and kind of spreading their way throughout the empty spaces. So in time, this is going to become, this section here will become just a solid um, kind of little mini forest of food, essentially for kind of more like for foraging, for um, harvesting and grazing rather than the annual vegetables. But we do grow, you can see the, the remnants of the leeks here. And yeah, again, these are, all, these are all going to be tidied up, ready for new crops coming in. So if you're wondering how you find a contour line on your piece of land, well, it's really simple. There's this really basic homemade um, piece of equipment called an A-frame. There's a line, there's a center line here. Uh, the string hangs down and gravity is pulling this bolt down towards um, the center point. And what you know is that when these two, the two feet of the A-frame, are at two points of equal altitude. The string falls down and is in line with your little line in the middle of the A-frame. And that tells you they are two points of equal altitude. And basically you're just making your way along the hillside, um, putting in markers, kind of finding, finding the two points of equal altitude. And slowly that kind of tells you um, where the line is. Now we, there's a funny story with this. In this garden is that there used to be a billy goat living in here uh, before this was growing space. Um, and he would move from gate to gate every day walking the same path. So naturally he wore, he wore a pretty, um, yeah, he wore a path into the hillside. And as I was going along with the A-frame, I looked up and I noticed that the line I was making was exactly the same line as that billy goat had done with his path. So he was walking the perfect contour line every time. Um, so it's a really good example of, yeah, observing, looking up and observing what nature does of its own accord. Um, a lot of the answers are there. So. Let's move on, keep going down. So here we've got our overwintered onions here. So these went in as sets in October time. And you can see some of the guilds we've got going on here. So there's a plum tree with rhubarb at its base, which is just starting to come up. There's a bit of strawberries finding their way through here. There's quite a lot of weeding to do. We need to do a lot of catching up. We're getting, getting on top of some of the grass that is starting to creep its way into the beds. There's apple trees all through here. These are all heritage Welsh varieties. And we've got raspberry beds, hazelnut trees. Do you keep hazelnut trees for hazelnuts yep, or do you keep yep. it for coppice? Or? Yeah, specifically for nuts, these ones. Yep. And then this is kind of a, a really great habitat in here. So we get a lot of snakes living in here, grass snakes, adders, um, which is really great. Yeah, so the biodiversity is really increasing. You can really see it growing every year um, with all these little habitats that we're allowing to live in the garden. And then we come down into the latest the most recent part of the garden to be made. This is three seasons old now. And you can see a little bit more clearly here what the beds look like when they're, when they're growing. Um, so this is our overwintered garlic. And you can see the wood chip paths. These are really great because they make it much easier to work the garden. Um, you know, you can work in any kind of footwear. We don't get muddy. There's no water logging that happens. But also the wood chip is inoculating the land with really beneficial back, um, fungi. Um, kind of yeah, interacting with the beds and we get great mushroom life in here now. Um, so yeah, it's a really, a really a model that we love. And again, as I said, really easy to step between paths um, without straining yourself, which is really important as well to keep us fit and healthy. Do you grow um, mushrooms on site? We haven't got into mushroom growing much. We've done, it, we've done experiments with logs a little bit, growing on logs to different degrees of success. Um, but no, it's something we'd like to get into more. So if anybody has any tips or experience, come down and we'd love to talk to you. So you can see a lot of black tarp right now over here. Um, looks so different. Well, I suppose everyone says that. It looks so different to the last time I was here. Yeah, so if you've only seen any of the other videos that uh, I've done with Jason, you'll see what the place looks like in the summer. This is just a solid 
mass of food. Essentially, we squash and corn and all kinds of things growing through here. But this time of year, we shut it down. We put it into its winter slumber with black tarp. Um, this will be uncovered in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we'll be dressing the beds ready for broad beans, sugar, uh, dwarf sugar snap peas. Um, yeah, and starting to prepare all of these beds. This was really interesting land because it was made up quite a few years ago with um, rubble and shale um, and really wasn't very optimal growing land, but through the no dig techniques, we've been able to turn that into a really productive, um, very quickly productive veg growing area. So yeah, and we do a lot of our composting down here. So there's a pile over here ready to use. Um, yeah, that was a hot compost that we made with a group in September. Um, yeah, so this will look very different in six months time. Uh, and then we, we look forward to showing you how it looks every month through the next through the next year. So if you'd like to come and volunteer with us, um, yeah. we'll be starting on March the 9th with the first volunteer day Thursdays, every Thursday, 9.30 till three. Um, no experience necessary, no duress, uh, just come on down. And um, yeah, it's a really great way to learn how to grow food or to be part of a community of people interested in growing and eating good food. Um, yeah. That's it, getting to meet like-minded people, getting to have a real tasty lunch, because I think that's what, for myself, has been one of the big things about coming here, is not only getting to know vegetables and uh, as well as ways of growing that you just never come across before, but ways in which to use those mm. vegetables mm. Um, and, and how to prepare and eat them. It just, yeah, it's you never would have thought of it, and also extremely tasty. Yeah, yeah, so come see us. We'd love to see you. All right, until the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See, See you again. next month. Bye-bye.